So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to run through the games. My instinct when I go through these games is I really want to show you every move because just so many of them were so cool. But I'm actually hoping that most of the people that are watching this aren't even Go players. And I definitely want them to be appreciable by non-Go players. So I'm going to talk about some of the key moves and why they were so interesting or unusual or cool and without going into great detail. And again, like I said, I'm going to run through this. Uh, now, I've already talked about the first three games in my prior videos. So if you're interested in those, go ahead and, and uh, look at my prior two episodes. Or I will also link to other analyses of all five games in my commentary. So if you're a Go player and you haven't gone through the detail of these games, you really do owe it to yourself. But uh, let's carry on. So... Oh, the Go World was so excited to watch Game 1 because we had no idea what we were going to get. And the question is, you know, would Lisa at all uh, do anything unusual to try to, to beat the computer? And, and would AlphaGo play moves that, uh, well, surprised us? And uh, it was fascinating from the very get-go. And from move 7 of the first game, Lisa et al. played an unusual move. And uh, we think this was an attempt to trick the computer. Uh, this move by Lee Sedal isn't in any of the standard openings. It's, it's really never been played by a professional, as far as I can tell. And I think the idea behind this was just to, to see if AlphaGo just memorized good moves or if it could think on the fly. But uh, as I've already mentioned, the way that AlphaGo was programmed, it was made to think on the fly. It was made to evaluate positions. So if you assume that this move has never been played by humans because it's suboptimal, well, AlphaGo was able to show that it was and gain a good advantage in the opening. Really interesting. But then just three moves later, AlphaGo surprised us again. And if you don't know Go, this looks like just a perfectly normal move. But if you're a reasonably strong Go player, you will know that this is a, this is a move that will get you sort of wrapped on the fingers by your teacher if you play this. It's, it's just considered a bad move. And this is one that's, again, been learned over centuries that don't play this move. And there's certain disadvantages to it, which I really won't go into here. But... Uh, nevertheless, AlphaGo didn't care, and AlphaGo played it anyway. And even more interesting, AlphaGo made it good. And the third really interesting move in this game was right here. And this received a lot of criticism at the time. So this is something that AlphaGo played. And it looks too cautious and too slow as a move. What seems like what it seems that AlphaGo was thinking is, uh, I've got a great play in store. I've got a great play planned. And... Once I play that great play, I want to make sure nothing can go wrong. So before playing the great play, AlphaGo just went and cleaned up the mess, right? He wanted to make sure these two stones couldn't come out. And in doing so, he pretty much settled the top left side. And this gave him time to do the move here. And this is the move that kind of uh, announced to the world that, hey, I'm here and I'm for real and my strength is that of a top pro. Because maybe a top pro would find this move, but uh, not many other people would. And uh, I want to point out this diagonal relationship here because we're going to see this again and again through the series. But at any rate, this black territory looks somewhat impregnable. And uh, yet AlphaGo jumped right in. And even though it sacrificed the stone, it was able to capture a good portion of this territory and therefore take an advantage of the game that it wouldn't relinquish. It was an amazing start to the series, and AlphaGo showed itself to be super strong. So then we came to the second game, and everyone wanted to know whether AlphaGo's victory in the first was just a fluke, or whether it was as strong as it seemed to be. AlphaGo actually played a bunch of surprising moves in this game. Uh, this move was surprising, and this move was surprising. Uh, but I guess none of these are earth-shattering. The one that was really shocking was when AlphaGo played here. Now, the reason it's surprising is we as humans, we're taught from soon after we learn Go, um, don't play this shoulder hit on a stone that's on the fourth line. So you can see that this white stone is 
one, two, three, four, fourth line, and this isn't generally considered a good move, and we're all taught that. And the reason is, it's too easy for white to make territory, and all of this can become white's points. But it turns out making points over here isn't the best plan for white, so this isn't what he wants to do. Uh, and he really didn't want to push up this way either because it makes him a little over-concentrated and doesn't even make him all that strong. So it turns out this move, which goes against all the wisdom that we're taught and wisdom of the ages, uh, turns out to be a really good move. And it surprised everybody. Uh, and in the context of this game, it worked really well. Now I think that Google also told us when they ran this move through the value network, uh, this was a move that only had a 1 in 10,000 chance of being right, as in, uh, you know, its common sense agrees with ours, but it was strong enough or, a, or flexible enough to be able to go ahead and overcome that tendency, right? Uh, maybe this is generally a bad move, but at this place and at this time, it worked, and it worked really well, and it was a surprise. The next really interesting move occurred after white invaded at the top. And this sort of invasion occurs all the time in, in games, whether you're amateur or professional. And in general, the response to this move is always going to be close. And uh, because you really want to make sure that that move doesn't have the flexibility to easily live. So the response is almost always going to be something like this, you know, within a space of that white stone. Or it might be here or it might be here or here, but whatever it is, the response is almost always close. This is what we'd look for all the time if a human was playing. But AlphaGo didn't do that, and instead AlphaGo played over here. And it turned out this was a really good move, and it sufficiently supported the corner so it wouldn't be easy for white to invade, and it also made it so that if white tried to run away, it would continue to put pressure. And in the end, this white stone was captured, and actually so were a lot of other white stones that ended up on the outside. So uh, this move isn't one that I think many humans would come up with, but it turned out to be a really good move in this situation. And once again, AlphaGo went on to win. So the third game became super important to Lee Sedal. He dropped the first two, and if he lost the third, that meant he was going to lose the series. But happily, he had black, which gave him the flexibility to do whatever opening he preferred. And he started with a nice big framework, and that's this area in the upper left-hand corner. So he was inviting white to jump inside with the intention of attacking whatever white did severely. And white obliged and jumped in. And you can see that, especially after black plays the next move, this white stone is kind of surrounded by four black stones. So even if you're not a go player, I hope you can intuitively see that uh, this is actually probably going to be difficult for white. Uh, and that was the plan. And unfortunately for Lee Sedal, the plan didn't work all that well because uh, it was only just a few moves later that uh, white had made this amazing move, and, and that's why I'm showing it. Again, we have one of these diagonal moves, but this is one that surprised everybody. Uh, so now all of a sudden, it seems that white is surrounding these three black stones. So the attacker has become the attacked. And I think people were expecting white to play at A or maybe B. Uh, and these are moves that humans would think of because they have a better relationship with, with these marked white stones. But instead, AlphaGo played this really weird-looking move, which surprised everyone. But it turned out, moves at A or B worked okay, but the move where, where AlphaGo actually played worked completely brilliantly. And it was just a few moves later that it became clear that all of these black stones aren't doing very much at all. But white is beginning to develop the whole rest of the board. And actually, at this point, uh, professional consensus is that white has already a really big advantage, and the game was too good. And unfortunately, white held on to that advantage throughout and won the series by winning the first three games. So then came the fourth game, and the series was lost, but Lee Sedol still had his pride. And it was a really fascinating game, and like game one, I think it's one of those games that people will remember a very long time. 
And as I watched the game, I was actually, I found it a little depressing because I was rooting for Lee Sedol. I wanted, I wanted humanity to win a game, you know, and his play just seemed so submissive. He wasn't his usual fighting self, but it turned out that this was all part of a big plan. So before we get to the climax of game four, there's one other really cool move that I want to show. And once again, it's one of these diagonal moves or shoulder hits. Uh, again, this was played by AlphaGo against Lee Sedal. Now, AlphaGo's objective with this move is to keep this stone separated from these stones, right? So that way, uh, Lee Sedal is definitely going to be weak on at least one side. But what's curious about this is this isn't the move that many humans would think of playing to separate. After all, it's, you know, it's, on, it's on the other side of these stones. Uh, but interestingly, it does. You know, the kind of moves that a human would think of is like this, right? This stone is physically between these other stones, and it makes sense that it would separate. But this move is a bit of a surprise, and it's really cool that it worked. And you can see that at this point, now these four stones are separated from the rest. And Lee Sedol was playing a style of go, uh, which is high risk, but basically wagers the whole game on, on a single conflict. And so what I was taking as submissive play was a deliberate strategy. And he made sure he got points here and here and here and quite a lot of points here that it was really going to be hard for black to do anything about. White made quite a lot of points. The only problem for Lee Sedol is that it looked like black had a lot more. The top is huge, black's got a lot of points here, and it looks like all of these points in the center are going to be blacks because these four stones look captured. As a matter of fact, when I looked at this game, I thought, doom, this game is done. And it was, and, and it was well, somewhat depressing. But uh, again, I underestimated Lee Sedol. And at this point in the game, he used basically the rest of his time for the next, uh, I don't know, six moves or so and you know, thought at least 30 minutes to figure out what the best way would be. And his objective was twofold. He either had to make these two stones live, or he had to be able to run away with them. And that was the purpose of this next move, give somewhere to run. And uh, AlphaGo said, no, 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 you will not connect, and white cut. And AlphaGo said, no, 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 I'm going to keep you cut off, and I'm going to take all the points at the top. And of course, if AlphaGo gets these points, AlphaGo wins. And Lee Sedol played a few more forcing moves uh, before playing right here. When Lee Sedol played this move right here, uh, he's got this rival, someone from his own generation, and uh, his name is Gu Li, and he's from China, and he's also an international champion. And he was broadcasting for Wei Chi TV. And when Lee Sedol played this move, Gu Li said, this move right here is the hand of God. And Guli believed that the move worked. And so I need to explain what I mean by the move worked. A move works if there's nothing the opponent can do about it. In this case, working would mean white either lives on the inside or escapes to the outside. And either of those would be good enough result to destroy black's territory. And because of all the points that white already has, white would win the game. Um, so when Guli first thought, saw this move, he thought it worked, and Lee Sedol was going to win. Now this move didn't surprise only Guli, who, who, you know, who proclaimed it so great. It actually turned out it really surprised AlphaGo, and its policy networks only thought that this move was a one in ten thousand move, as in. Uh, this is unlikely to be the best move, and it's probably one that it didn't research as hard as the others. Despite that, the continuation that happened was really curious, and that is because further study has shown that this wedge here, this move by white, doesn't work, and it would be refuted by this black move. And the, most of the refutations run only 10 moves deep, which is almost trivial for a pro. And a few interesting things happen. Now, the first is that I already mentioned Lee Sedol used nearly 30 minutes of his time trying to figure out this move 
you know, using the moose prior and, and this one. Uh, but AlphaGo, which had n a, nearly an hour left on the clock, it didn't use time. It used its standard two minutes uh, to play. And I guess that would be fine if it found the refutation, but it didn't. And instead, AlphaGo played here. And so this is really interesting, and I'll talk more about, about these few moves later. Uh, but at, in the end, they led to AlphaGo's demise. And uh, at this point, I don't think it knew it was in trouble, but just a few more moves later, and its confidence chart went boom, 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 boom. All right. So uh, a couple more really interesting things uh, that I'm going to talk about a little bit more later is AlphaGo, after it thought it was behind, it played here. And this is just a really weird move. And it's the sort of move that we call being on tilt. And um, a Go player, like a, a, a poker player, is considered on tilt when they start playing irrational moves that just don't work. And this is a great example, because Lee Sid always able to counter like that. And AlphaGo played some more moves that are tilt-type moves that just don't work, like this one over here. So again, I'm going to come back and talk about these a little bit more too. But so good news for humanity. Uh, the wedge, the hand of God won, and Lee Sedol had his win. Yeah. So game five was really interesting. Lee Sedol had his win in game four, and we were all curious to see if he'd solved AlphaGo and would able to beat it again. Those of us who were watching were all pretty sure that Lee Sedol gained an early advantage when white misread a sequence in this lower right corner. And this is a sequence that humans know, and, but it's not something that uh, is easy to discover. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a sequence of moves that we know uh, because we're taught, and, and we're taught because it's in books. And the reason it's in books and not something we would just intuitively see is because it involves a double sacrifice. First, black throws away these stones, and then after they're captured, throws away one more, and in so doing, wins the race. So this sequence of moves even has a name, and we call it the, the tombstone. Uh, so most strong Go players will know this, and certainly at least Sedal did, but it was apparent that uh, AlphaGo didn't know this. And actually, I think while the game was going on, uh, the Deep Mind team tweeted that, yeah, AlphaGo didn't know the sequence. And it was at this point that AlphaGo realized, oh, this doesn't work, and went ahead and played up here. And, but very soon, we got yet another diagonal play, a shoulder hit. But this time, it was from Lee Sedal. And uh, the usual response to this move is would be either be to push here or to push here. This is how we humans are trained to think in terms of a shoulder hit. But AlphaGo didn't do that. And instead, AlphaGo played all the way over here and actually started a pretty severe attack on that black stone. And a lot of commenters who were watching this thought that maybe this was overly aggressive from White and a risky strategy, but it turned out really well. And when White got this point is when the game got a little bit sad because up to this point, I felt, and I think most viewers felt, that Black Candidate had an advantage. And I suspect that Lee Sedol believed the same, because he played very cautiously at this point. Some people wanted Black to play here, and others recommended here, but, you know, moves that would take in a little bit more territory. But Lee Sedol opted for the safest play, right here, and, and then make life right here. But the only problem is this let white surround a whole lot of territory in the center. And, and that actually created a situation that turned the game around. If Lee Sedol had a small lead before, that was no longer there. And it seemed that uh, white was in control. And the game stayed very close all the way to the end. But uh, unfortunately for Lee Sedol, uh, he was about two and a half points behind and he resigned and the series was over. But what a series it was. Okay, so let's talk about DeepMind and AlphaGo for a little bit, the significance of this. And I'll, I'll focus on AlphaGo itself first. Uh, let me start by complimenting Google and DeepMind uh, on their performance. 
This was truly amazing. And I described earlier in this video that Go is a multi-generational game, you know, with an institutional memory. And humanity has been building up our knowledge of this game for millennia. Yet, with 20 developers and two years, uh, DeepMind was able to beat one of our best. And that's really impressive. Uh, also, I think it's really awesome that uh, DeepMind published all the specifics of how they did it in Nature, in the journal Nature, uh, because this is going to let other people reproduce it and maybe build upon it. And then I guess uh, the first question to ask is, okay, well, AlphaGo uh, won four games to one. What does this mean for its strength? And there's a variety of answers. And the most skeptical answer I've seen uh, came from the professional community that complained, well, we haven't seen enough of its games. And we've seen, especially in game four, we saw that it had bugs, you know, it had problems. And uh, they're convinced that if we could see enough of its games, that we would find enough bugs that any human pro would be able to beat it. So once we know its weaknesses, we can beat it every time. And I guess that's possible. I don't think that takes away from the raw strength of AlphaGo. And I suspect some of these bugs are fixable by, uh, by DeepMind, if they choose to, let's hope. Uh, and maybe some of the bugs are just part of the system, and there's nothing they're going to be able to do about it. It's based on the way that AlphaGo was trained. The second assessment of AlphaGo's strength came in the respect that the Korean Paduk Association uh, showed it. This is the Professional Go Association of Korea. And after the series, they presented uh, DeepMind and AlphaGo with a Nine Don Certificate of Strength. And Nine Don is the highest rating that a Go player can get. So that's tremendous respect showed to DeepMind and AlphaGo by the KBA. The website GoRatings.org has put the games of AlphaGo into its database and based on its performance so far has placed AlphaGo as the number two player in the world just behind Kujie, the young Chinese champion. And this uh, uses an ELO type algorithm as we see in chess and a lot of people are applying to sports today. Uh, so this is uh, pretty convincing and is based on real data. So another analysis comes from a user on Reddit whose name is Lulz Oaf, something to that effect. And uh, anyway, he did a Bayesian analysis of AlphaGo's performance. And Bayesian analysis is an advanced statistical technique where you take prior information and posterior information and try to draw conclusions. And so he drew a confidence graph of AlphaGo's rank. And you can see here that, you know, this is Kujie's rank. And the peak probability for AlphaGo's graph is just a tiny bit weaker than Kujie's. But the total area under the graph is to the right. And so his estimate of AlphaGo strength is a little bit stronger than Kujie. So using this Bayesian analysis, it seems likely that AlphaGo is the strongest player in the world. So one more assessment, and one to take with a, a pinch of salt, is a self-assessment done by the DeepMind team. And this was based on AlphaGo playing earlier versions of itself and giving it handicap stones and pounding it into dirt. And, um, and from this, they were able, they concluded, you know, an ELO up near 4,500, which would be significantly stronger than any human in the world. And, but again, even they're throwing out the caveat, and you can see it down here, you know, ratings that are based on playing other bots or playing itself aren't really reliable. So there's a chance that this is right, but the real answer is probably somewhere a bit below it. Uh, and as a matter of fact, if this rating for uh, AlphaGo was true, I think there's something like a 98% chance that AlphaGo should have won all five games against Lee Sedol. Anyway, I guess we can conclude by saying AlphaGo is really strong. And if it, certainly if it gets rid of its bugs, it's probably the strongest player in the world. But right now, it's being compared with the strongest player in the world, Kujie. And for that reason, I really hope we get a matchup between Kujie and AlphaGo. Come on, Google. Come on, DeepMind. You know you can do it. 
Okay, but now let's talk about the significance of AlphaGo. And let's start off with some of the, the negatives or the, the questions about it. And uh, reading professional analyses of these games, uh, in virtually every game, there were end game plays that were considered suboptimal. And these were moves that the professionals would look at and say that they can mathematically prove that AlphaGo had a better move than the one it played. And um, I'm sure they're right. But in the end, it didn't matter because AlphaGo's lead was big enough that it wasn't going to sacrifice the win by playing a slightly suboptimal play. And the only game that was really close, which was the fifth and final game, it managed to hold on to its lead to the very end. So uh, I guess there's a chance that these endgame mistakes would really become a factor in a game, but we haven't seen that yet. The other interesting thing that happened was that it didn't know again in that fifth game, a very specific sequence that humans know called the tombstone. And uh, humans know this because it's so hard to find intuitively. This is a sequence of moves that involves a double sacrifice and you just wouldn't find yourself without someone showing it to you. And in this case, it's in hundreds of books and it's been known for hundreds of years and is a great example of that institutional knowledge or generational knowledge that I was talking about that we have with Go. And it's really interesting that uh, AlphaGo didn't have it and, and, uh, and, and therefore was surprised by these moves. Now, one curious thing is that AlphaGo is not knowing the sequence didn't really affect its... Uh, probability of winning. And this was a presentation that was done, I think, in London. And you can see this uh, over here, this red area is AlphaGo, what it thinks its chances of winning are. And it never really had a big dip based on that sequence. And it seemed to consider it a perfectly acceptable sacrifice. So game four is where the really curious and interesting bugs and uncertainties come up. And they all start with that famous wedge, the hand of God move. And I already mentioned that it doesn't work, but, uh, it, but it's really curious how things played out. And there's an interesting confluence of events, right? Number one, AlphaGo had lots of time left on the clock. And number two, um, there's a sort of deterministic definite answer to this problem that shows that this move doesn't work. And yet AlphaGo didn't use its time and it didn't find the correct answer. So why would this be? Well, the time on the clock, I don't know if it makes a difference. I don't know if AlphaGo had used 15 minutes instead of two minutes to determine its next move, if it would have come up with a different result. And I'd be really curious to hear what the DeepMind team has to say about that, and I hope we find out. Uh, was it a bug that AlphaGo didn't use its time? Now, the second part, uh, in terms of being able to find sort of a deterministic, I go here, he goes here, he, I go here, he goes here, answer to this uh, is a personification problem, right? This is how a human would think about the problem, but AlphaGo isn't human, and AlphaGo doesn't think like that. And instead, AlphaGo thinks in terms of probabilities, and it simulates games and says, if I play here, I'm going to win 60% of the time, and if I play here, it's going to be 58%, and so on, and in the end, we'll choose the, the one with the highest probability of winning. So the human reading uh, they convince themselves that this sequence will work and read all the likely possibilities. And indeed, once they're convinced it works, they will play it. And there was so much time left on the clock that that human approach would work and work well in this situation. And, uh, but the computer dealing with probabilities uh, came up with a different solution and came up with the wrong solution. And I don't know... Uh, if there's going to be an easy answer to that. I don't think that's a bug. I just think that's a completely different way of thinking about Go. And the final thing I want to talk about in this game and with AlphaGo's behavior is when, it, when I described it as going on tilt. And that's a, a move like this. This is behavior we've seen in Monte Carlo bots before. And I assume that the explanation is going to be somewhat similar. And a move like this could be explained uh, with this approach that the computer says, and all likely outcomes, if we both play normally, I'm going to lose. Right? All of my probabilities of winning are below 50% and maybe a lot worse than that. So no matter what I do that's normal, I'm going to lose. And what happens if I play a move like this? Wow, 
if I play a move like this and the human ignores me, then I'm going to be able to get an advantage from the situation. And, and all of a sudden there are possibilities that if I play this random looking move, I'm, I'm going to win. And so the computer might choose such a move. The only problem is no rational human is going to ignore the move. They're going to look at this and they're going to say, okay, I can easily defeat that move. I can, I can answer it and it won't work. Or I can play somewhere else and give, you know, AlphaGo two moves in a row. And, oh, that could be really bad. So, of course, the human's just going to play here, just as did Lee Sedol. And it makes sense why the computer would think this. Its hope becomes, oh, maybe my opponent will make a mistake. But, of course, that's not going to work against a top player. And the explanation for this move over here uh, is similar and a little bit different. And this gives us a chance to talk about what's called the horizon effect. Let's say, and again, I don't know the number, but uh, let's say that AlphaGo makes its assessment of the game, say, 20 moves out. Right? It'll uh, read various moves, 20 moves out, and assess the board at that point. And let's say that when it's looking at the board right now, in this situation, and it, it assesses all the board states 20 moves away, it doesn't like any of the results. All of them result in likely losses. So what's a bot to do? And the answer is, okay, it knows that it's going to make the evaluation 20 moves out, and it knows that currently everything that's 20 moves out is bad. If it can come up with a result that's 20 moves out is uncertain, uncertain is better than bad. So by adding a move here, now all of a sudden at 20 moves out that it can read, maybe the situation is less certain. But all, it's, all he's done is delayed the inevitable. This black group is going to die, and the result is good for white. But if, it's, if the computer is making the assessment 20 moves out, it's just beyond its ability to read. So it's uncertain, and uncertain is better than dead. Of course, the way humans read is deterministic, and we'll read 21 or 22 moves if that's what's necessary. So this move to the human eye is just plain bad. But if you think about it as the horizon effect, moving the possibilities out beyond what you can read, creating uncertainty, it makes a certain sort of sense.